his voice, but I'm so thankful that we can uh, go to him and in prayer, and it can be just something simple as doing the dishes, cleaning, driving, down on our knees, but I'm so thankful that God has made every option for us to communicate with him, and how vital that is for our, our survival and for our daily walk and for our peace. You know, the world is always trying to to take that peace. I know that's the word <coughs> of Satan out there trying to disrupt us, but you know, we're not ignorant to those devices. He's not given us, um, he's not left us here, I should say, without a source. And I'm thankful for the communion that we can have with our Heavenly Father. Yes, right. Up, but 
Lord puts it on your heart and mind, it's you know, he'll he'll give the increase. Okay. I think it's key G. Say good evening to you. It's good to be in God's house. And uh, I'm going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes tonight. Uh, the first chapter, just going to read a couple of verses there. I want to say while you're turning, it's good to be in service tonight with James and Linda Turner and Nancy Unger. They, my humble beginning started with them. They ran, Brother James was pastor of uh, Wheeling Church of the Nazarene. And uh, Linda, that's his wife, she helped teach in the school. And I went through preschool there and I went through, uh, uh, went through kindergarten there. And then I went back uh, in the summertime and had, they had summer uh, summer camps for, and that's where I went during that time. And I remember, Nancy may not remember, but I remember when I was a little boy, the ripe old age of about five, we had a we had an aquarium in there. And I took a I took a crayon and colored all over that thing. Now they didn't see that as me expressing my artistic ability the way that I did. And I got sent to see Nancy, and she applied the Board of Education to the seat of learning. You know what? We need that in our school system again. That didn't warp my personality. That helped me learn respect. And I, they, those three people right there made quite an impact on my young life. I've never forgotten them and just ran into them, uh, ran, into, uh, ran into James and Linda over at Texas Roadhouse on a Sunday. Praise God. You can fellowship around a steak, amen. And uh, and 
I got to talk, I've been wanting to see him for a long time. Hopefully, ran into him. And Brother James said he's pastoring a church now over in Anderson. Is that correct? James, are you 80? I'm not trying to. Is that what you told me the other day? 82. So you have read that verse in the Bible where it says there is no discharge from this war. <laughs> you know what? I say praise God for a man 82 years old still going. Yeah. Took a church out of a split. It was about eight people when they got there. Now they got about 50 or 60 going. I say praise God for that. Amen. So I'm glad to be in church with them tonight. All right, the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. The Bible here says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the evening. Thank you for the way you've arranged it. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. I pray that you'd help us preach for a few minutes and honor us with the Spirit of God. And I pray that you give glory and honor to yourself, and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I have, uh, I'll be honest with you, I've had a fascination for a little while now with what's called the wisdom books of the Bible. And when we talk about that, of course, we're talking about Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job. I don't claim to understand them all. I, I think the, I, I, me and Dad's talked about this, the book of Proverbs is just more than a collection of pithy sayings. There's a, there's, wealth of, there's a wealth of knowledge in there and wisdom that I think without the Holy Spirit's help, you are going to have a hard time under, getting everything that's in there. But the book of Ecclesiastes, it's amazing. The, the Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. And if you've read Proverbs and then you read Ecclesiastes, you wouldn't think the same man wrote both, both, uh, both books. The reason for that is when you come to the book of Ecclesiastes, you're dealing with a man who is now cynical. He, the, we're talking about 12 chapters written about a man's pursuit to find happiness and satisfaction under the sun. That means in this world without God. And uh, I will say this, Ecclesiastes is written in Solomon's twilight years. He's an older man now. Uh, I would say, I don't have proof of this, but I would say from the right collection of the writings, I would say that this is even writ past the time of when he went off the rails and uh, followed off with his wives and went into idolatry. I think he's reflecting at the end of his life things that he gave his heart to search out and find. And really, the book of Ecclesiastes is not a message from God. You don't find God saying anything in the book of Ecclesiastes, but the reason, to, but the Bible says all scripture is written by, by inspiration. And the reason that we have it is, and I think the reason that we ought to study it now and teach it and expound on it is because in case you were thinking that there's some avenue in the world that you can go after and get that you're going to find satisfaction and happiness and contentment outside of God, you are not going to find that. And let me say this, we as Christian people need to be reminded we're living in a materialistic society. We're living in a world where, you know, I mean, everything is driven to our five senses and, uh, and, but I want you to know something. This is amazing to me. The, it said, he said in verse two, he said, vanity of vanities saith the preacher. That's what Ecclesiastes means, the preacher. Well, since he's preaching, we better listen to the message. Ecclesiastes is a big message. He said, vanity of vanities saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, I will share this with you. I find it interesting. Vanity is translated, our English word vanity is translated from the Hebrew word hevel, which means vapor. And when you look up the term vapor, you, you know, everybody's seen a little bit of a steam coming off of a hot cup or a smoke or fog. The other morning I got up to go on a drive and pray. That's what I do my best praying while I'm driving. Uh, I'm ADHD, so my body's got to be doing something for my mind to stay on task. So I'm, I, I, amen, some people have a prayer closet. I've got a prayer car. It don't seem to bother the Holy Spirit, so I'm just going to keep on doing it. So I got up on Sunday morning, and there was fog. I went out in the country, and there was fog everywhere. Fog, as Larry Brown would say, so thick you could cut a slice of it and put it in your pocket. I mean, it was thick. But here's the thing about a vapor, of, and it's like smoke or fog. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. You see it, and you think it's real. Try to grab it. As you move through it, all of a sudden, you see it's just like, you know, Tina loves cotton candy and the kids love cotton candy. Cotton candy is the nearest nothing that ever was. I'm just going to tell it like it is. It's about 10 bucks for a bag of air. 
You put it in your mouth and you get a, you get a nice little sugar high for three seconds and it's gone. You know what? That's what Solomon said everything is. It's an illusion. See, the thing of it is, is and, and I'm going to preach, don't worry, I'm going to preach the whole book of Ecclesiastes, but don't worry, I know that nobody here has drank enough coffee for me to go through verse by verse. I'm going to do a summary overview. There's about five things that Solomon says, I went after, I gave my heart to know, and when I got to the end of it, it was empty, it was meaningless, it was vain. That's what vanity is. And it'd be good for us, like a Brother Jim was saying a moment ago, he said, you know, people say they want to spend eternity with you know, and Christ in heaven, but they don't want to spend any time with him down here. That's because they think and they can find some fulfillment in one of these avenues I'm getting ready to talk about. The thing of it is, is you can run hard after it and you might even attain it, but it won't fill your soul. It won't satisfy your spiritual man. I mean, it, listen, you trying to fill the spiritual man with things in the world is the equivalent of you being hungry and taping burgers to your arms. It doesn't, it's not going to do any good. Now I'll say this. I think Solomon is the most qualified author to write this book for three main reasons. If a man's going to if a man's going to give commentary over everything in life, then he has to be meet these three standards. I thought about this. Number one, Solomon's the greatest author for this book because he's the wisest man that's ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. This is what the book says in 1 Kings three and twelve. Behold, I have done according to thy words. That's God speaking back to Solomon. He said, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither shall there, be, neither shall there arise any like unto thee after thee. Even Jesus Christ commented on the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon had so much wisdom, people traveled thousands of miles just to hear him speak. I will say this, there, listen, you can take Elon Musk and Bill Gates and you can wrap them all up together. They, couldn't even, they wouldn't be a drop in the bucket to Solomon's wisdom. He's the wisest man that's ever lived outside of our Lord. Number two, he's the wealthiest man that's ever lived. Second Chronicles 9.13 says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year, this isn't his whole life. This is how much came to him in one year. Six hundred, three score, and six talents. A talent is a hundred pounds of weight. So that's saying six hundred and sixty-six pounds, or, or, or how many, that turns into tons of gold came to him in one year. But biblical scholars say that Solomon's net wealth was between was around two point two trillion dollars. Somebody said, "Well, I know somebody's a millionaire." <laughs> Solomon would laugh at that. Two point two trillion dollars. He's probably comparably in his time the wealthiest man that has ever lived. Second Chronicles nine twenty two says, "And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches." He's the wealthiest man. Let me tell you something. If a man's going to tell you that there's no sense in running after wealth, a poor man better not be telling me that. It better be somebody that's got a little green in his pocket. And I'll say this. He's the worldliest man that ever was. When I say that, I don't I, I, Let me give context. To this. Some of you are going to laugh at this. When I say worldly, I'm talking about that he knew a lot about the world. I mean, this is what it says in 1 Kings 4, 33 and 34. And he spake of trees from the cedar that is in the leaven and even under the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He could talk about the greatest of trees in detail, even down to little, little weeds that grew out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowls and of creeping things and of fishes. And there, he ca and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon for all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. I, I, I laugh when I think about saying that he's a worldly man because I think about Gomer when he's getting ready to go out on his date with Mary Grace. On Andy Griffith, if you ain't never seen Andy Griffith, you need to get saved. <laughs> and he's talking with Barney, and, and Gomer's all nervous because you know he had never spent no time with him. And he told Barney, he said, it's easy for you, Barney. You're so worldly. <laughs> he said, you've been everywhere there is to be. You know everything there is to know. He said, and you've been out with some waitresses and even a registered nurse. What he was trying to say is, is that I haven't had any, in his simple country way, he's saying, I don't have any experience. And to me, you've been everywhere. And then Barney told him, he said, hang in there, Daddy. I'll be with you to make sure the evening don't take. And the, and the way that Barney could say, loosen up and smile, will you? Amen. It's Wednesday night. Praise God. Everybody, everybody in here watches that show. Don't act like you don't watch it because you got in here. Amen. I believe it'll be on at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the greatest show it was ever on television. But I think about that. Solomon was that way. He was worldly. Not, he could speak about all kinds of cultures. He knew all about the creation. 
There's not anybody that knows more about this at this time under the sun than he did. So I'd say this man, being the wisest, the wealthiest in the world, is this man actually has license, he has the credentials to tell us about what pursuits would be under the sun going in any of these given directions. Let me say this, there's five things that Solomon said he gave his heart. When he said he gave his heart, God put wisdom in his heart. What he's saying is, the wisdom that God gave me. I will say this about God's gift. When God gives, he gives. You realize Solomon said even in his latter years, even after he'd went off the rails, he said, my wisdom is still with me. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He said, I took the heart that God gave me and I applied it to these things and I went after these things and I experienced these things. But when I got to the end, it was vapor, it was smoke, it was fog. It gave me the illusion that, uh, that it would satisfy me, but there is no satisfaction in it. Number one, wisdom and knowledge. So when I say wisdom and knowledge, I'm not talking about he applied his heart to godly wisdom. He sought, he sought after philosophy, man's wisdom. The Greeks, even Paul, the apostle Paul said, Greeks seek after knowledge. It's what they prize. He said the Jews seek a sign. He said the Greeks are looking for wisdom. It's what they prize. Uh, the Bible doesn't speak good of man's wisdom in anywhere, place, shape, or form. Matter of fact, if you read the book of Colossians, it said man's wisdom will spoil you. Spoil means it's going to rob you of some things. Ecclesiastes 1, 17 and 18, he said, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this, uh, this also is vexation of spirit. Vexation is irritation. It means there's no peace inside. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth in knowledge increaseth in sorrow. The more knowledge you gain, the more you've got to worry about. You ever heard the saying? I don't know how true it is, but they ever heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? You know why? Because you don't know, you can't worry about it. I heard, uh, I heard a man say that had been an investigative journalism for now for a better part of 20 years, and he's learned things about our country he wished that he didn't know. He's learned about how the corruption of things he wished he didn't know. And he said now, he said it's almost turned him into a raging alcoholic because he can't hardly sleep with all the knowledge he's gained. It's hard for him to go to sleep knowing the things that the military has covered up. Hard for him to go to sleep knowing the things the government has covered up. I don't know if you know this or not, but there was a time that the government gave LSD to citizens without their knowledge just to test them on it. I thought I'd let you in on that in case you didn't know, in case you was thinking about trusting your government. Trust the science, my hind leg. Amen. I'm supposed to trust people that told me we came from monkeys. You got another thing coming. Listen, somebody said, well, I've got all these. You know, I'm going to say this because I don't want to lose anybody. There's nothing wrong with having worldly knowledge as far as you having degrees or great education as long as you have it with the fear of the Lord. Brother Mitchell said it a long time ago, and it's true. He said, education without salvation produces reprobation. There's a lot of truth in that. Amen. Not only that, he gave himself to wine and pleasure. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 3, he said, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. It's not good for people to be given unto themselves to 24 hours a day, seven days a week of their pleasure. At wine and play. Listen. I know, I know that there are folks that drink because they're self-medicating. They're in pain or they're trying to erase their path. I get all that. I understand that. But there's people that are now, I mean, there have been a lot of people they said that it only took one sip of alcohol to turn them into to falling into full-blown alcoholism and drunkenness and all those other things. It's like this. If it satisfies, how come you have to have so much? I mean, seriously, if, 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 uh, if dope does it for you, how come you got to smoke more than one joint? Why do you got to put another line up your nose? Flesh can't be satisfied. And it, what amazes me, and I, I'm saying this facetiously or whatever, but you know, there's television shows about reality people who are the wealthy and the famous, and we're stupid enough to watch them. Let me tell you something about them. Those people without God that have everything under the sun, they're miserable. 
But Haley used to watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but I ain't blaming her. She was a teenage girl. She still watches that now. She needs to get saved or get right or something. But when she was a teenager, she used to watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians. You know what? Them people had money, and they went on vacation after vacation, and none of them had to work, and they were the most unhappy, fightingest bunch of messed up people you ever saw in your whole life. You know why? Because that don't satisfy the soul. Howard Hughes had more money than, than many generations could spend, and he spent the latter part of his years collecting his own urine in jars and sleeping on, t on tissue paper. So what I'm trying to tell you is, listen, you can have it all under the sun. If you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you got nothing, Jack. You got absolutely nothing. We live in, just being honest with you, we live in, in a party society. We do. We're living in a time where people now can't stop partying long enough to go to work and support themselves or their families. I went to high school with a girl, and I don't say this to, sh to shame her, but it is a shame. And I saw her picture where she got arrested. It wasn't long after we got out of high school because she had went down to the Oasis to drink all night, and she left her toddler at home because she thought she left the door locked that everything would be dandy. But you know as well as I do, Children, when they want to go somewhere, they'll figure out how to get there. He unlocked the door and was going down the street at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. His mom's down a few blocks down the road getting drunk at a bar. What I'm trying to tell you is, listen, what's she looking for? Happiness, but it won't be found there. Satisfaction, but it won't be found there. When you're satisfied, you're done. See, here's the thing about it. I got saved in 1997. I've been, I ain't been looking to get saved since it satisfied me. Amen. Praise God. I'm not looking for anything. Now, what's those something? I'm looking for another time of fellowship with Jesus Christ. I'm looking for another good service to get into. I'm looking for another movement of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord said, if you ever drink this water, you just have to drink it once. Amen. He said, it be in you a well spring up. You know what he's saying? What I'll give you will satisfy you. Amen. You know, in Asbury... At the university, and I wasn't there. I don't know what all took place. I, I do know some pastors that I trust their discernment. They went. One man told me, he said, the presence of God was so thick in that place that he sat in a wooden chair for 36 hours straight because he didn't want to leave. Just use the bathroom. He said, he said, there were young people lined up as far as you could see, some of them four and five deep, begging the Lord to release them from the addiction of pornography because they're so bound by it doesn't sound like to me it satisfies doesn't satisfy listen moving on moving past those things this is an avenue that even that a lot of good people get caught up in Solomon turned to work and labor Ecclesiastes 2 4 through 7 he said I made me great works I built me houses I planted me vineyards I made gardens and orchards I planted trees and them all kind and in them all kinds of fruits I made pools of water to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. That's what it says in verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. I want to say this about work. It's good for a man to work. It's good for anybody to work. Matter of fact, I think you're going to have more problems mentally if you don't work. Do you realize that yeah. in the beginning, God didn't give man church. He gave him work. God didn't give Adam a church. He gave him work. That We have a relationship, and it's built around this work. And I think it's good for us to work. I mean, even though even on the days I don't like going, I still have to admit it's good for me. It's good for my mind. It's good for my body. But I'll say this. You'll never fulfill yourself or reach any kind of satisfaction because you work your life away. I've worked it, and I know Brother Mike could talk about it. I know Brother Roger could. I know my father could. I know Matt could. We've all worked. We've worked in the automotive industry, all of us, and we've all worked with men that if, if they let them work five minutes over on Christmas Day, they'd sign up for it and do it. And let me say this. If folks are in need or they're in a tough spot and they need all that, I'm not against that. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this. I have known men that literally have worked their marriages away, worked their children away, worked their friendships away. And you know what they got today? Zero. Listen, that's like this. We live or we work to live. We don't live to work. 
We just work. We just work so we can have to provide to keep all this. And we don't, our sole purpose in life is that what we can build. Right. Let me tell you something about your legacy. Because people always say, "Well, you know, I'm going to leave behind this legacy." You're going to leave it to somebody that didn't work to get it. They're not going to appreciate it. And nine times out of ten, they'll destroy it. That's why nothing lasts. You can't appreciate it if you didn't work to get it. So I said, and. Let me say this about the, uh, the rich man with his barns. He found out how much his work was worth. And, I'll, and it's like this. Somebody said, well, I'm laying up for another day. You may be laying up for somebody else to enjoy it. The rich, the rich fool, that's what he was. He was a fool. The Lord said, I'm going to give your stuff to somebody else because you're going to be dead, fool. So what I'm saying is, is work is good. Just don't make it the focus of your life. Don't work so much you ain't got time for God. If you're too, I'm going to say it. If you're too busy for God, my friend, you're too busy. You need to cut something out of your schedule like yesterday. Solomon found out that there was no satisfaction in women. First Kings 11, 3 through 4, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. This man had a 1,000 mother-in-laws. If there was Prozac in his day, he was on it. And his wives turned away his heart, for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. It's like this about, uh, and I, I, I made that joke about that, but I've had children in the back ask me, they say, you know, in the Old Testament, there were people that had, there were godly people that had more than one wife. I said, but it never worked out. They may have had them, but it never worked out. Didn't work out for Jacob. Didn't work out for David. Sure didn't work out for Solomon. You know why? Because in the beginning, God made one man, one woman, that's it. If you can't be satisfied with one, you won't be satisfied with a thousand. And I will say this, there's people that mock marriage. Let me tell you something, marriage is the greatest thing that God has given us outside of salvation. I'm going to take a step further. If, you're, if, you're not, if you don't pay attention to your Bible, it's the most important relationship in the Bible. All other relationships are commanded to come second to it. That's why a man leaves his father and mother. You can't be married to your mom and dad. Can't, and I'll tell you something else. Don't be married to your children because your children are going to leave and you still got to be married to that individual. Don't lose them through 20 years of raising your children. You love your children, but you're never married to them. It's the only relationship where God said two people become one. It, 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 marriage is a great thing. It's a, it's a God-given thing. And I, I want you to know that it's been cheapened today and it's been ridiculed and people say, well, you know, it's just easier to live together. And if things don't work out, we can leave. And I'll tell you something else for all the people saying, well, we need to try this out before we get married. Statistics have already proven that if you live together before marriage, the, the likelihood of divorce goes up, not down. You know why? God is always going to be right. God is always right. And I'm thinking tonight, and I'm not saying this to embarrass this individual. You wouldn't know her anyway. My wife has a friend that she grew up with and they went their separate ways in life. And this woman told my wife she has had so many sexual partners she can't count them. She doesn't know. Sometimes multiple people in the same evening. And after years of that, she sat with my wife in her car on a lunch break, sobbing now, with 20 years of that. And she said, Tina, I would give every bit of that to have one man that loves me. God's way's right. It's always going to be right. And I want you to know something. That applies to men just like it applies to women. Sitting there with all this, I want you to know something. She has marred her soul, her conscience. The only thing that will help her is the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. to purge that and to put that away. 
If she never comes to that, she's going to be plagued with that until the day she dies. You think about that. The reason I'm preaching this message, God put this on my heart. See, people get ideas that if I get more, I'm going to be more satisfied. If I build more. We've all, everybody here, we've all uh, dreamed, well, you know, what would you do if you, if, you, if you had this much money? What would you do? Isn't it fun? We take that little dream, we say, well, if I did this, I'd buy everybody in my family this, or I would, the first thing I'd do is this or that or whatever. I want you to know something. If it was given to us and we don't have the fear of the Lord, it's going to ruin our lives. You know who the most uh, plagued people on the face of the earth? People that's won the lottery. In so much they made a documentary out of it. People said it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. People lost their health. They lost their families, lost their wife. Listen, I said all that to say this, and that brings me to my point. So Solomon, through all these chapters, said, I gave my heart to no wisdom. I gave it to no wine. I gave it to no pleasure. I gave it to no work. I gave it to no wealth. He gave it to no wealth, too. Nobody had more than he did. I gave it to no women, all these things. And the book, and you know, 30 sometimes in the book, he said, but it was all vanity. It was like vapor that I was reaching out trying to get a hold of, and there wasn't nothing I could get a hold of. And I thought, and I'd go down this avenue, and I'd reach out, but I couldn't get a hold of it. And I'd go down this avenue, and I'd reach out. This man comes to the end of the book, and this is the, this is the way the book concludes. I love this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's like this. Somebody else pointed this out, and it's been good. So you know how it is. If you share anything good with a preacher, it only gets to be yours about once, then it's ours after that. Especially, I'll cite where I got it maybe one or two times. After that, all of a sudden, it's mine, and I'm just saying it. In the beginning, when God created everything, do you realize that the fowls came out of the sea? It wasn't just fish. The birds literally flew up out of the sea. That's where they came from. That's their source. When God created cattle, it stood up out of the ground. That's its source. But when God made man, God didn't speak man into existence like he did them. God took dirt and formed a man, but the man was not alive. In the beginning, blood is not what made man alive. God's breath made him alive. Never forget this. You're a spirit first. You are a spirit that possesses a soul and lives in a body. If you're looking at it the other way around, you're going to be messed up, Jack. We're not bodies. We're spirit beings. So our life literally came out of God. We didn't come out of the sea. We didn't just stand up out of land. Our, so since our life came out of God, that would make him the source. So if you remove us from the source, we're just like a fish out of water going So even though we're trying to run after all the things that's mentioned in Ecclesiastes, this is what they're going to be. Yeah. Suffocating, suffocating, suffocating. If you put Jesus Christ in a man and you put the Holy Spirit in a man and he's in a right relationship with God and his neighbor, he doesn't need anything else. I believe that whether you do or not. He doesn't need anything else. Some of the most happy people on the face of the earth didn't have nothing, but they knew who God was. I will say this, and I think you'll agree with me, those of you that's been in church a long time. The stories I've heard, two generations, three generations behind me, they enjoyed life way better than we do. Didn't have near as much. Didn't have the cars we've had, didn't have the homes and stuff that we've had. Didn't have access to all of the pleasure and everything else. So I said, why is it? Because they feared God and they kept his commandments. God was, see, God wasn't a figment of their imagination. God was real to those people. And what I have learned is, and I've been a person, and I've been young, and I've been ignorant. And I remember when I thought, you know, when I started working at General Motors, and I had money coming out of every pocket because I was still living at home, and I thought, you know, happiness is found in jewelry and cars and video games and all that stuff. You know what? I wish I could go back to Chris at 21 years old and snatch all that money out of his hand and put it in my pocket and say, buddy, that's not going to satisfy you. 
fellowship with Jesus Christ every day and let him open up your soul and let him fill it, you won't need anything else. I'm preaching this message because I believe with all my heart there's young Christian people who come to church. Maybe necessarily their heart doesn't really get open. and They don't get full. And because of that, all of a sudden their eye begins to wander out there thinking maybe there's, I mean, I'm not saying I don't want to be saved. I don't want to know the Lord. But maybe there's something out there that'll fill this. Let me save you a whole lot of time and heartache. It won't. You'll be right back here with a broken heart and a bunch of regret. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Love him, trust him, hold him in awe. That's what fear means. That don't mean be afraid of him and keep his command. Obey him. Here's, and I'm closing. God's commandments is not to rob us of having a good time. God's commands are to keep us from hurting ourselves. It's just like you telling your kids, don't cross the street. I remember my mom, we lived on Cecil Road where we saw one car every other month. And mom was convinced I was going to get hit by a car out there. Chris, when you go outside. But here's the thing about it. If I do it on the wrong day. It's because she knew. Because I, I had a friend that lived across the street. And I, and I was an only child. So whenever I got to go over there and play, I opened the door. And I went wide open across the street over to his house. My mom would holler out. She said, Chris, stop. Look the road. She wasn't trying to kill my buzz. My good time. She's trying to keep me from getting hurt. God's commands ain't trying to rob you of nothing. God's not going to withhold any good thing from you. Read the book to them that fear him. He's trying to keep us from hurting ourselves. I'm through preaching. That's my little thought for this evening. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, uh, James and Linda and Nancy. Sure was good to see you all again. You can come here anytime at your church. Don't want